on the coast of North Carolina remains the last wild population of red wolves in the world. An animal so secretive, many people are unaware that it even exists. Living entirely within a single refuge, the Milltail Pack is the largest of the three remaining packs of this eastern wolf. Due to their low numbers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife monitors them from the sky and the ground to protect this species from a second extinction. So many people don't realize that red wolves are a thing. And unfortunately, that goes for locally as well. They're just a, a magnificent animal. So we've currently got 17 radio collared red wolves on the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. Based on the, the strength of the, the beat, you can kind of get a sense for what direction they are and how far they are. The problem we have right now is that our red wolf population is so low. Yeah, I'm not picking up anybody okay. here. Dang it. Red wolves once roamed throughout the southeastern United States and numbered in the thousands. But when the human population increased, much of that wilderness was lost. Many people feared the wolf. Those fears led to government-sponsored extermination programs. The red wolf was first listed as in danger of extinction under the Endangered Species Preservation Act in 1967. And between 1973 and 1980, the few remaining red wolves were captured to begin a captive breeding program. Due to their importance in the ecosystem, the new goal was to rebuild the red wolf population. But in 1980, they were officially declared extinct in the wild. This meant that the entire survival of the species was dependent upon managed breeding programs. Nothing like this had ever been done before with a large carnivore species with the intention of getting the numbers up and releasing them back onto the landscape to save an endangered species. Before release, the wolves are outfitted with radio collars that allow biologists to study them from a distance. The radio permitted hands-off monitoring of the wolves since each collar contains a transmitter which will help locate the wolf on the landscape. A deer killed on a nearby road is set out as a going away present. At last, this first pair of wolves will get a chance to make it on their own. The innovative techniques that were developed as part of the Red Wolf Recovery Program led to the successful reintroduction of red wolves in North Carolina. But not only did it do that, it paved the way for other gray wolf, Mexican wolf reintroduction programs. It was the first reintroduction for a large carnivore on the landscape. This happened eight years before the gray wolf reintroduction in Yellowstone. We're here near Yellowstone National Park because the gray wolf reintroduction that happened here in 1995 was built on what was learned from the red wolf reintroduction project that happened in the 1980s. We reintroduced 41 wolves. It was an experience of a lifetime really has flipped Yellowstone. It's changed the ecosystem. It's very important to spread this word that wolves aren't what people used to think, but they are very important inhabitants to ecosystems. What we've learned from recovery efforts of gray wolves in Yellowstone National Park has been an important lesson when trying to save other endangered carnivores, like the American red wolf. Life is constructed in kind of like a triangle where you have very few species at the top and a lot of species at the bottom. And wolves sit at the top and they eat species from the next level down, which they're more of. 
and then they eat the species at the next level down below that. So nature is all interconnected. And when you take those few species out at the top, it changes everything. And what people did is we came along and we took them out. And so when you don't have these carnivores, the plant eaters population explode and they overeat the vegetation. When they overeat the vegetation, any other animal that uses that vegetation doesn't have habitat. Wolf predation is built on vulnerability and weakness. In general, they cannot go out and kill any elk or deer. If that animal's healthy, their chances of killing it are very low. In fact, in Yellowstone, wolf success rate on elk is five to 15%. They live on the weak animals. It's a myth that wolves show up and my hunting is gone. Your hunting may be better. Humans tend to take the healthy. Wolves tend to take the weak. By removing that sick animal from the herd, it's removing that disease from being spread to the rest of the herd. And there's also some evidence that that disease, blue tongue, brucellosis, by removing those diseases from the landscape, they can actually stop that from transmitting to our livestock. For decades, the Red Wolf program flourished. The Red Wolves grew, they bred, they got up to almost about 150 Red Wolves in the wild. Just a few years ago, some anti-wolf movement spreading misinformation really changed that landscape there for them and made it very hard to do conservation and increased poaching, increased the loss of the species, and we're down to just about 30 in the wild today. You think of what we've dealt with in our culture, you know, portraying this wolf as the big bad wolf. And that's our job, is to be able to talk about what wolves are actually like. Wolves are very shy, they wanna run away from people. Another challenge that the red wolf faces is that when their numbers are really low, they may hybridize with coyotes. When Europeans moved into the United States, they eradicated the gray wolf and the red wolf from the ecosystem. The coyotes took that as I'm gonna move wherever I want to now because they didn't have wolves there to keep them in check. The concern of hybridization between red wolves and coyotes can be alleviated with a large enough red wolf population size in the wild. But when their numbers got so low and they were desperate and couldn't find another red wolf to breed with and they saw a coyote down the street, they're gonna choose that coyote to breed with. Once the wild population of red wolves is large enough, this will allow red wolves to very easily identify other red wolves as mates, and this will exclude any possibility for hybridization. I'm gonna try a few more signals from here and see if we can pick up some members of the milltail pack. The biggest thing I want people to know about red wolves, quite honestly, is that they actually exist. You know, I live here locally and, you know, it's incumbent upon us to get that message out. I've got to find these guys for my own peace of mind. The fundamental question is, do humans have a right to take over the planet? This is a real test for our will to live with other species. A lot of people think things like they're going to decimate prey populations. They're going to decimate livestock and what we've seen with recovery efforts is that that's not actually the case. By restoring American red wolves back to the southeastern United States, we can restore balance to their ecosystem. The Red Wolf Species Survival Plan is made up of 43 institutions across the United States that are all working together to help save the American red wolf. By breeding animals in enclosures that could be re-released one day, conducting important research on red wolf behavior and educating the public, they help spread awareness about this amazing species. In managed care, animal care staff across the various institutions involved in the Red Wolf Species Survival Plan program 
raise the red wolves in a way that does not habituate them to humans by avoiding contact with the red wolves. Wolves are naturally afraid of people, and that's a huge survival skill that we want to make sure they maintain. And when they get the call to be released back out into the wild, they have survival skills to not only stay away from people, but we feed them natural prey like white-tailed deer. They have puppies, so they learn how to raise a litter, and they learn how to be a pack, a family that can survive out in the wild. The only time animal care staff is hands-on is to administer vaccines. And while it is a little intimidating for the pups, it reinforces a wolf's natural inclination to run away from humans. Nice job. All right, guys, collapse up here. Ready? We're going to go in real quick and make sure the puppies are in the den as they should be. It's a little one. It's a little one. Boy or girl? Boy. Are you ready when you are? Oh, man, we're so feisty. What these pups represent is hope for the American red wolf. Every pup born in the breeding program has a chance to help with the future reintroduction of the red wolf back into its native habitat. So that is, uh, it's a male wolf, 2186, uh, born in 2016. So he's getting ready to be a three-year-old male. Yay! We do need to get the word out about how wonderful they are and, and that we hope to preserve and, and grow this population both locally and hopefully in the future, you know, in other areas so we can have a true wild population. The people, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and myself, and the biologists, we believe in this species. We have dedicated years, uh, some of us, you know, a few years, some of us 30 years of our lives to this species, and this country it would be remiss to not have this species on the ground. It most definitely can be done. I definitely believe that. I absolutely think red wolves need to be conserved. What conservation organizations are working towards now is to help bring this species back to the southeastern United States to help restore the American landscape. Our vision is a place where we have red wolves in the future, where my kids can go out into the wild and hear a red wolf howl. Think about how often we talk to other countries and say, you need to save your rhino or your elephant. And here in our own backyard, the red wolf is one of the most endangered mammals in the entire planet. Restoring the red wolf back to the American landscape will create a healthier environment for every living thing. <laughs>